everybody, welcome. It's good to see you. I invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to start our time praising our God and declaring how He is worthy of all of our praise today. Come on, let's lift up our voices. It's already been done. You can add to His blood. It was once for all. The Father gave His Son.
And I won't forget the moment That I heard you call my name Out of the grip of darkness Into the light of grace Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life Where there was death My hope and freedom are found in Jesus' name, just like Lazarus. Oh, you brought me back to life. No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I am born. of Jesus from almost 2,000 years ago. He spoke to some of the people who had decided to follow and trust him to be his disciples. These are the words that he said. He said, I, Jesus, give them, the followers, eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I wanted to share this with you today because for those of us who are in this place who have decided to put our trust, our hope, our faith in the person of Jesus Christ, you find yourself under this promise. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That is the promise. And so be encouraged by that assurance today. 
But also I know when we gather like this or folks who might be you know, watching online, there, there are many people who have not yet decided to really surrender your life to the Lordship, to the authority of Jesus. And I just wanna say, I don't know what's holding you back, but there's no time like the present for you to say yes to Jesus in this moment so that you too can inherit this promise. All it takes is us fixing our eyes on the Savior and saying yes to following in His way. Every one of us is gonna face challenges. Everyone's gonna have trials. We all have an enemy that wants to separate us from the love of God, but here's the promise. If you fix your eyes on Jesus, you will be held in the hand of God. And so in just a moment, Emma's gonna continue to lead us just for a little longer in this song. We're gonna sing some words that declare this scripture, okay? We're gonna sing these words. So let's lift our voices, our faith, our hearts in this place. Amen, come on, let's sing. before you and we recognize that uh, God without you we would be lost but in your love for us you've pursued us you've made available a way for us to be in relationship with you if we say yes to Jesus and who he is so Lord I pray that for every one of us in here today Lord help us say yes to you more and more more and more Lord we want you in our life Thank you for the gift of this community, the gift of worship that reminds us of who you are and whose we are. When we declare we belong to you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. And come on, let's give us some glory. If you've been brought back from death to life, from dark to light, we celebrate you, Jesus. Yes and amen. Well, hey, so glad that you're here this morning. Why don't you turn to a few folks who are around you. You can shake a hand and say good morning and grab a seat. morning how's everyone doing yeah man that was awesome wasn't this let's give it up for God man it's so awesome to be in this place yeah well I'm Dave Shattuck I'm the director of IT and facilities here at Foundations Church and we are so glad you're here with us today and those of you joining us online welcome as well hope you're staying nice and toasty um, I'm actually kind of warm right now are you guys warm this week it's kind of nice I, I have to be honest so oh it's Dave's birthday today. It's Dave's birthday today! Just wanna say happy birthday. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, it is my birthday. I'm turning, I turned 47, so, you know. Hey, thank you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. And no singing, no please. Uh, my family's gonna do that to me later. Anyways, uh, if you're new here, uh, we are so glad you're here as well, and we would love to connect with you. 
Um, so if you can text new to the number on the screen here, um, we would love to um, just um, get you connected and, and meet you. So afterwards, too, to stop our next step, we have a gift for you that we'd love to give to you. So um, if you're new, we'd love to check in with you after the service. So also uh, next week is our baptism weekend. And so if you have placed your hope in Jesus Christ and have never been baptized, we would love for you to take this next step. And so after the service today, we have a baptism orientation um, that we would love for you to come um, if you want to get baptized or if you want to learn more about what it means to get baptized. Come to that class right after this service. It's going to be in a prayer room by the next step area. Also, ladies, if you were able to join us for our January Blues this last uh, Friday at Windsor, um, they had a blast, I heard. But if you missed that, we have another one coming up this Friday here at Loveland. So ladies, make sure to come for that. It's going to be a lot of fun and some food there. I think they're playing Bunko is what I've heard. I don't actually know how to play, but I heard it's fun. So you should definitely check that out, ladies. It's a good time for you guys to all gather. So make sure next Friday um, to join us for the January Blues. Also, if you are a guy, this is important for you to hear this. In two weeks is our men's retreat. You don't want to miss it. So if you have not registered yet, make sure to register today. It's going to be a great time. We're going up to the mountains. We're going to hang out together, goof around. But also we're going to have Grant there as, pa as well as Pastor Carl and Pastor um, and Brandon, our family pastor. They're going to be speaking to us. It's going to be a lot of blast. It's going to be a blast. So you do not want to miss this, guys. So if you have not registered, do it today, okay? Make sure. So now I'm just looking at all of you, so don't forget that. So um, anyways, again, we are so thankful you guys are here today. So welcome. Good morning. My name's Grant. I want to welcome everybody here today on this bright, sunny, warm summer day. It's <laughs> fantastic out there. I'm, I, it's a great day to go for a walk. I'm, I'm not gonna, but it's a great day. <laughs> it's a great day to do that. Uh, playoffs are on. So I want to welcome uh, you guys here. I want to welcome you in Windsor, those of you joining us online. I, I love this series because uh, we've just been talking about how, as a follower of Christ, you're supposed to transform. God wants to meet you exactly where you are. He loves you as you are. He wants to meet you in that spot, but he doesn't want to leave us there. He wants us to be transformed. And for every day, for the rest of our life, he wants to transform us into something New. It's kind of like the way my wife found me. Um, when my wife found me, she uh, she was not impressed. Uh, we met in college. I had just moved literally a couple weeks off of working on a ranch in Nebraska, and I had moved to the college, and we were there, and I'd gotten a job as a custodian. She was working in the cafeteria, and I was standing waiting for her to get done with her job. She was she was cleaning up and getting done, so I could come in and empty the trash, and I could mop the floors, and so I was just standing there sort of watching her, leaning on my mop, you know, and I just thought I was just standing there looking at her, but what she saw was she saw me standing there, a guy in, in, in bib overalls, because that's what you wear when you work, and, and a dirty John Deere hat, and, and to top it all off, I had a t-shirt with cut off sleeves. <laughs> and I was just kind of standing there, so she, this is kind of a picture of what she saw, just a, just a little bit. Now, if you think that's sexy, you're from Nebraska, but... Um, <laughs> But anyway, I was just kind of standing there. So what she saw, she just saw me stand there going, hey, baby, you know, like this. And uh, she avoided making eye contact at all costs, and, and she wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. So it took me a couple of years to get over that first impression, and uh, I had morphed a little bit. But eventually, I'm per persuasive. I, I, I talked her into dating, and we were even talking about marriage. And one day, I came home from the cafeteria, or came home to eat, and I was at the cafeteria. She was there, and uh, it was steak night in the cafeteria, which didn't happen very often. And I was really hungry. And, uh, and so I was mowing through, like, three steaks, you know. And my mom taught me. Mom, you taught me this. You're supposed to use a knife and a fork. But like when you're really hungry and you got to get all the meat off the bone and everything. So I was just in there mowing through these steaks and there was grease dripping down my hands. And 
She told me, she like literally during that moment, she was watching me eating a steak thinking about breaking it off. So <laughs> anyway, she has morphed me over the years and turned me into the sophisticated, cultured <laughs> individual you see before you today. <laughs> so thank her for that. But, uh, but in the same way, that's what, that's what Christ wants to do. Like, he, he takes us right where we're at, but he, he wants to transform us into something uh, completely new and different. And so because of that, today, we have been talking about discipleship, this series. It's a little bit different series. We're talking a little bit, a little bit vision about, like, what makes uh, foundations a church and what is our, our, our strategy for discipleship. And so last week uh, and the, the week before that, I showed this Venn diagram. Now, my wife's still working on me because after last week, she was like, you're not going to keep showing that, are you? And I, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I think so. I think I am because, because I want to burn this into your brain. Like, I want you to, to be able to remember this because following Jesus, being transformed in the image of who he is, is actually very simple. You have to do the work. You have to, like, be faithful to it. It's vitally important that you do it. But it's actually very simple. We talked about uh, last week, it's just about the fundamentals of our faith. Just fundamentally, we are people who need to believe deeply in the core uh, fundamentals of our faith. We, we don't need to just hear them. We need to build our life on them, and then we need uh, to, to practice those in our life. This week, I'm going to talk about mission. It's vitally important as followers of Christ that we are on mission. That's how we grow. And it's important that you have biblical community. You're, you're in communica- community relations, uh, relationships with people who are of the same faith, who are going in the same direction as God. Now, you, this is you. This isn't anybody's responsibility. If you grew up in a church and you grew up in a home, this is not your parents' responsibility. This is not the church's responsibility. You have to want this and to make these priorities in your life. And if you do that, you will grow and be transformed in your relationship with Christ. But as a church, we want to help. And so what we do as a church, like literally everything we do revolves around helping you grow in one of these three areas. So we have weekends. We talk about the fundamentals. We have teams that we invite you to join and be a part of. Everything from a children's ministry to greeting to the student ministry to small group leaders. Like we want to jo- invite you to join teams and get on mission. And then we have groups where we want to encourage you and help you and, 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 and connect you to something more than just what happens on the weekend. Now, with that, let me kind of pause and, and do my little commercial break. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking about Rooted, and I want you to know that Rooted actually starts with a launch with everybody uh, together. So uh, I wanted to show you kind of an image of what we did when we launched it at the church I was at in Michigan. This is what we're going to have happen in two weeks, February 5th, 6th, and 8th. We have two opportunities here and one in Windsor. It doesn't matter whether you go to this campus or Windsor, just find one of those opportunities uh, that works. And we're going to launch like this. We're all going to come together as a church and we're going to get off on the same uh, page. So I just really wanted to invite you uh, to be a part of that. Now, what's really exciting is um, we have over a thousand people that have signed up to be a part of a rooted group. That's where you clap. Yeah, there you go. Um, now, some of you might be a little frustrated because you go on the website and you're just like, man, there's, it seems like there's only like 12 groups or 18 groups or something like that. I want you to know if you haven't checked, we probably added more. We've added more since last week, so we're continually training uh, leaders and getting them in place. Uh, but also, we have over 95 groups. So the, the reason you, you don't see them is because they're already full uh, of people. So I would invite you to, to be a part of that. I would invite you to, uh, to go on there and look or maybe look again and uh, be a part of that. It's launching in just two weeks. And especially if you're new, this is an incredible opportunity. If you've been, uh, if you're maturing your faith, you've been growing your faith, this is a great opportunity to connect uh, with other people. So commercial over, but sign up for Rooted. Okay, today, today we want to talk about mission. Uh, we want to talk about what it means to, to be a part of the mission of Christ. And I just, I can't drive this home uh, hard enough. We, we grow by being a part of the mission that Christ has called us to. We, we, as we engage in that, we actually find ourselves being obedient to Christ's 
calling. And our, our mission, we sometimes get distracted, but our mission is really simple. It's just two words. Make disciples. That's, that's the goal of our life. And it doesn't really matter where you're at. God is inviting you into that mission. In fact, when Jesus approached Peter and Andrew, they were fishermen. And they were fishermen, and, and Jesus walked up to him and said, Come, and I will make you fishers of men. And they left their boats. They, they came back to them. They still had to earn a living, but they just walked with Jesus. And they said, Okay, we'll, we'll go wherever you go and do whatever you want to do. We'll follow you. We'll become fishers of men, even though they didn't even know what that meant. They didn't even know who Jesus was. They, but Jesus was already inviting them into the process of making disciples. So you might think, well, I'm a new Christian or I just started coming to church. And I'm telling you, this is one of the first things that Christ calls you into doing. And there's a reason for that. Yes, it's because, it's because there's, there's rewarding work. It's exciting to, to be able to, to change people's lives and connect them with their heavenly father. And, and there's probably nothing as, as rewarding as seeing somebody make a decision to follow Jesus. But it's also because it's also because this is how you grow. This is how you grow in your relationship with God. Francis Chan says this. He says, if you really want to experience God, go and make disciples. I think we are all looking for that experience for God. Sometimes you come in here on the weekend and you're like, man, I just want to worship because that's where I experience God. Or maybe you find it in other avenues. And those things are all really good, but I'm telling you, the heartbeat of God is to, 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 to take back what is lost, to, to heal and reconcile what is broken. His heart is after uh, making disciples, people that follow him. And so there's no opportunity we have that's better than to engage in that. And, and sometimes it's because you get to see front row seat, you get to see somebody make a decision to follow Jesus and have their, their sins washed away to live in the new life of the Holy Spirit and you can, just, you can just see it inside of them, the fruits of the Spirit and, and God working and leading and guiding them and, and that's amazing and that's a part of our growth. But there's also times where, where we work hard and we share our faith with people and, and, and desp in spite of our best efforts, they reject. They, they walk away. They say... No, and I don't know if there's a moment that you're more in God's spot than that, where, where God, who is brokenhearted over this world that he created and he died for, watch people reject him all of the time. And through both of those experiences, we, we grow and we learn to be more like him. So today, I want to invite you, I want to challenge you to be a part of the mission, but I will tell you, I, I, I know how it feels. It, it kind of feels a little overwhelming. You're like, okay, like, well, what do I do? <laughs> what, what, do you, what, what am I really going to contribute to the mission? Well, you are actually vitally important. I know for me, it felt like a heavy burden. I, I became a new follower of Christ, and I was just so excited. I wanted to share my faith. I shared it with my family. I shared it with friends. I was talking to people. I was telling them why, you know, and I, I, I was excited, but I wasn't very successful. And in fact, I said a lot of stupid things. And uh, it was about after about a year and a half, I, I just remember thinking, man, I've been a believer in Jesus for a year and a half. And, and this is a bad way to think about it, but this is the way I thought about it. I was like, and I ain't even made one convert yet, you know? And that's just, this is not a good way to think about it. And it's too heavy a burden. And one thing that I've, I've learned and realized and you see in scripture is, is that God calls you as if you're a follower of Jesus. He calls you to do your part. He calls you to be the messenger, to, to show the love of Christ, to be Jesus to the world around us. But there's, there's two other important parts. One, God's got to do his thing. God's got to call people to him. He's got to convict, and he is always working on people, but God's got to show up in their life. And then there's another piece. The, the people, they have to respond their heart has to be in the right place. They have to, to want that. And without those other two pieces working, you, you're not going to be able to make it happen. All we're responsible for is to do 
what Christ called us to do, and we're to be the messengers, and we're to be Jesus to other people. So today, what I want to do is I want to show you how simple, and I want to show you how many opportunities we actually have all around us in our day to day life. In Colossians chapter 4, I believe Paul makes it so simple of what it means to be on mission every day of our lives. He says, Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. What he's referring to is here people that don't believe in Jesus, people that aren't a part of the church. Now, I think it's important that we put people in two different groups because these are the only two groups that people put God puts people in. There are people who know and have a relationship with Jesus and there are people who don't. We categorize people all the time, but those are the only two groups of people that God categorizes or puts people in. We we shouldn't put people in categories of rich or poor or democrat or republican. We shouldn't put people in groups of black and white. We shouldn't we shouldn't separate the way we separate people. The only thing that matters is do they have a relationship with Jesus or do they not have a relationship with Jesus? And as you think through, if you find yourself talking to somebody that doesn't have a, or you find yourself in a group with somebody that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, you should be wise. You should be thoughtful. Your actions, your behavior, your words become increasingly important. He says, make the most of every opportunity. I promise if you're leaning in, you will find opportunities. But usually the opportunities we're looking for, I mean, it it may not be what you think. You're probably never going to have your neighbor come over and knock on your door and be like, hey, I just... I just wondered if you had time to tell me about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's probably not the opportunity. I mean, if you're looking for that opportunity, it's probably not going to happen. And if it does happen, it'll probably be during the playoffs. <laughs> Which you should still do it, okay? But it, that's probably not the opportunity that Paul's talking about. I think the opportunities that arise every day are the opportunities where you have a chance you have a chance to respond differently than everybody else in this world responds. You have, a, you have an opportunity, you have a situation that you're in, and there is a golden opportunity for you to be different than everybody else and respond differently. How many people here at Loveland Online and, and in our Windsor campus, raise your hand if you've ever worked in a really negative work environment. Oh, that's, I saw one of our staff raise their hand. Um, I guess they're gone, you know. Um, <laughs> no, you go into that environment, it's just super negative, and everybody, and everybody complains about the boss, and everybody complains about their coworkers, and everybody complains about that one particular co- coworker, and there's gossip, and there's back, you know, people talking about each other behind each other's backs, and it's just like, it's just like a toxic environment. Now, when you go to a place like that, you can get sucked right into it. You can just go along. You can talk like they talk, and you can be upset about the things, and you can do it all under the name of being authentic. But you have an opportunity. That is your opportunity to to not be holier than thou and not to chastise people for their negative behavior, but to walk in there and just be, be somebody that seems to have hope, that seems to come from a different place. That maybe a joy that isn't based on their circumstances, but but maybe that you have your hope in something bigger than your work environment. You have an opportunity to be something different. Or maybe it's when you've been wronged. The best opportunity that I believe Christ gives us is when we have been wronged and we think that we we need justice for ourselves, and justice is the most important thing. That's an opportunity to be something different different. Uh, We lived in Michigan for 12 years in the same house, and it was built in the mid-70s, and and, and so was our whole community. And there's about six houses that were adjacent to ours. And and right in the middle of our time there, the city drainage stopped working. So got clogged up. We went to the city. The city wasn't going to do anything about it. So we just had this water that was pooling in our backyards. And so about the last 12 feet of my yard uh, was underwater if it rained quite a bit. And so my neighbors, I noticed it got worse one day because my neighbor found a solution for that. 
he took his property and he built it up. Like he built it up by about 10, 12 inches, right? And he laid this down, put some railroad ties in there. And so he, he solved the problem for himself, but he made it worse for everybody else. And then everybody else was starting to build up their property. And, uh, and there were other people doing that. And I thought, I guess that's what I need to do. I, I can build up my, I mean, $1,000 and then a Saturday afternoon and we can fix this whole problem and save the end of my yard, you know. And, and I thought, but that's just going to make it worse for everybody else. So I was like, well, how, how is this an opportunity? And then the other thing is I didn't want to get into like an elevation war because of just one day where, you know, people in Michigan can be a little feisty and um, <laughs> we're just going to get into a battle and all of a sudden I'm going to have a ski slope, you know, out of my bag and we're going to have this mound. And so I just, Bethany and I were th talking about it and, I, and one day I just, I just went and got a, a sump pump dug a hole with a bucket, put some holes in there and stuck it in the ground and ran 150 feet of hose out to the front. And I just pumped water out every time it rained. So I pumped everybody's yard actually uh, out. And it was an opportunity because their water all sort of flowed towards us. And so that was my responsibility. And I hated it. <laughs> One of the best things about moving to Colorado is like, I don't have to pump the water anymore. But that was just an opportunity. And because of that, one of our neighbors came, knocked on our door, and said, could you tell me about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I'm just kidding. He didn't. <laughs> That'd be pretty sweet, though. That'd be a cool ending. No, it doesn't end that way. It, it resulted, though, in just continuing a good relationship and being a good neighbor and being thought well of by the people around you. There's, there's always... There's always opportunities everywhere. There's opportunities to serve people uh, around you. There's opportunities to do all those different things. And we need to be people that are paying attention and looking for those opportunities. I'm convinced that there's more that exists than we realize. And then Paul continues and he says, let your conversation be always full of grace. Always full of grace. Seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I have found the secret to good cooking, at least baking. Just double the salt. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried this, but if you have a recipe that calls for chocolate chip cookies and they want a quarter teaspoon of salt, put a half teaspoon of salt. Trust me. It's really good. You don't want to go too far. You don't, you don't want to make it feel like you're licking a salt block, but like, if you put more salt in there, people are going to like it, and they'll be like, wow, these are so good. And I'm like, yeah, just, just more salt. I used that today during the nine, and a guy ran out to his truck, and he brought me back salt from Utah. <laughs> and he said, uh, this is ancient salt, which begs the question, isn't all salt ancient? <laughs> but anyway, I'm looking forward to trying it. Uh, so I love salt. That's my point. But it's just... You just add a quarter teaspoon more, just a little bit more salt, and it changes everything. It changes the flavor of, of anything. You know, Paul's saying, just do that in your conversation. Just take a little bit of grace in every little conversation. Sprinkle in that grace. Talk graciously about people. This is, this is a huge opportunity that we have. Every day we have an opportunity to talk differently. If you work in that work environment, talk graciously. Talk graciously about people. And, and hear me on this. This is important. If you have to leave early, I don't want you to miss this, okay? Talk graciously about people that aren't in the room. That is how you represent Jesus because, because people are pretty good about talking to people's faces the same. They're, they're pretty good about being gracious to somebody's face, but when somebody's not in the room, people aren't, people aren't always very nice. That's not human nature. You stand out when you speak graciously and lovingly and compassionately about people that aren't even there. That's like something that's not of this world. And let me go a step farther. I'm talking about talking graciously about people you'll never even meet. This year we're coming up on an election year, and we know how this is going to go. I don't imagine that many of us are very excited about what we probably can perceive as going to be our, our presidential candidates. I don't know. Maybe you're excited. I don't know. Maybe you live deep in the mountains. So, um, <laughs> but we're going to have to vote for somebody, right? And as that time approaches, here's what's going to happen. We all know it's going to happen. We're all going to get super polarized and we're going to get entrenched in our kind of side and we're going to start talking about people and I'm telling you, 
How you talk about Joe Biden matters. How you talk about Donald Trump matters. These are people that are created in the image of God and who God desperately wants a relationship with. How you talk about them is, is just as important as how you talk about anybody face to face. Paul says if you'll sprinkle that grace in, in every conversation, you will see, you will see God work in those moments. Now, we don't, we don't necessarily like that. We don't like the idea that in every conversation we're going to have to be on our game. We're going to have to like pay attention all the time. And, and I'm telling you, that's what it means to follow Jesus. You don't take a break from this. You don't have that one group of people where you just kind of let your hair down and say whatever stupid things on your mind. You are a person who is obligated to guarding your words and being a gracious, loving person in every circumstance, and that's how you grow. In fact, the Apostle Paul, man, he takes it up a notch. 1 Corinthians 9, 19, he says, Though I am free, which is true, and belong to no man, which is true, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. I don't think we like to hear that as 21st century Americans. We were born to be free. Great. Use your freedom to enslave yourself to the greater need of everybody you know. Use your freedom in Christ to make yourself a slave so that other people might be able to have a relationship with Christ. And then he goes on to tell us what he means by that. And what he means by that is he, he's going to address two different audiences or several different audiences, and he's going to say, I just kind of become whatever I need to become to be able to reach these people. And the people he's talking about are people that have tried to kill him. These are people that have tried to persecute him. And this is what he says. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one not under the law. Though he has his convictions, he's not changing what he believes, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. He knows that, that salvation doesn't come by being obedient to the Old Testament scriptures and commands. He knows that it comes through faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Like, he knows that. That is a conviction that runs deep in him. And yet, knowing that, and knowing that there are people that oppose him in that, he does whatever he can. He speaks kindly. He, he tries to understand the perspective. He starts where they're at, and he guides them in that way. And then he kind of flips all the way to the other side and he starts talking about Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles. Man, they, they hated each other and they had no common ground. And so he talks about the Jews and then he says, to those not having the law or Gentiles, I became like one not having the law. Though he knows his convictions, he knows what's true, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law the law. He goes to the other side of the aisle. He completely changes his perspective. He's not just trying to reach Jewish people. He's trying to reach everybody, and he changes his approach, and he changes his posture, and he changes his demeanor in order to be able to do that. He says, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. Why did he do this? Why did he shape shift? Why did he change? Why did he empathize? Why, why was he so understanding of every different group? Well, he says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save everybody I talk to. No, so I might just save a few. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessing. Even the apostle Paul is acknowledging this is my discipleship. This is why I've matured in my faith. This is why I've grown is because I have learned to model the life of Jesus, to lay down my life, my thoughts, my opinions, my convictions, my background, my heritage, my personality. I change it all and I become a slave to every individual because that's all I care about. The only thing I care about in life is that people would have a relationship with the one who made them and died for them. And so he does whatever is possible. And he calls us 
to do the same. Christ invites us. He says, pick up your cross, lay down your life. Forget about your, who you are and your identity and become something, become something new. Become somebody who makes disciples. In, in 1 Peter, Peter echoes some of the same kind of things. He kind of sums up everything that Paul's already told us. He says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. I hope you can see what's at stake here. What's at stake here is not just you, not just your family, not just your neighbors, but everybody you come in contact on a regular basis. You have been called to live this every day of your life. You've been called to be on mission. And again, it's not just for the people that you're going to reach. It's for you. This is how we become like Jesus. So to make it really simple, I think our mission on a day-to-day -day life, I think there's far more opportunities than we realize if we're paying attention. Our mission looks like a few things. Represent Jesus with your life. We do a lot in the, in the name of authenticity in our world, which is good. People always come up to me like, I just love you. I'm just, you're just so authentic. And I'm like, authentic's good. Unless your authentic self isn't that great. <laughs> like what I mean by that is sometimes we use the license of authenticity to just be who we are and never really grow or challenge ourselves or change. Nobody needs that kind of authenticity. The world needs people who recognize Jesus in you. Represent Jesus with your life. Be on in every conversation you have with people. Pay attention and look for those opportunities. With your words, with the things that you say and the way you talk about other people, be full of grace. I think we probably need to talk about social media. It's a good place to talk about this, especially going into an election year. Uh, before Facebook, I didn't actually know what to preach about. But now I got content for years. <laughs> because the people who were coming to my church, they would start to nod, and I would tell them things, and they'd walk away. I'm like, all right, we got it. We're all good. And then everybody started getting on Facebook and Instagram and everything. I started following people. In fact, the only reason I follow you is just to, if you ask for a follow, I'll, I'll friend you. My hope is that you'll remember that your pastor's watching. That's it. That's, <laughs> that's the only reason. But, uh, but then I realized these same people are living life. In fact, I would literally have these scenarios where, like, on Sunday, somebody would post, uh, checking in at the church that I, you know, was the pastor of, and they were checking in at church, getting my worship on. And then on Wednesday, there'd be sort of a weird post, like, you would not believe the moron I ran into at Safeway. <laughs> and we're like, okay. And then it's just dot, dot, dot. Like, oh, I guess we have to ask. And then on Saturday, it would be somebody at the club doing shots. Not having a beer with friends, not a glass of wine at a restaurant. I'm talking about doing shots at the club. And then on Sunday, time to get my worship on. And I'd be like, just stop. Just don't tell them what church you go to. Like, just <laughs> stop it. All the time represent Jesus well when you're on social media and you're thinking, man, there's, there's people, I mean, I, you got to have friends that like went to high school with or something. You got to have friends that aren't believers of Christ. Like what, what on earth are you doing? Pay attention and represent Jesus well. And I'll just say this, if, if those of you in here, I mean this seriously, if may, maybe you have a let's go Brandon sticker on your car and, and you know what that means. If you don't know what that means, it's like go Google it. But if you have a Let's Go Brandon sticker on your car, scrape it off. Like, we have razor blades and stuff. Do it before you leave. It's a nice day outside. We'll help you. <laughs> or scrape the foundation sticker off, one or the other. <laughs> Do one or the other. We can help with that, too. My point is, in everything you do, are you representing Jesus or are you re representing your perspective? Which leads me to the next one. Prioritize people over perspective. As a parent, I am right. I'm just right all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> a few, few claps there. Like, 
I'm not right all the time, but I'm right about the majority of things. I know I'm right, and I get in these arguments with my kids. And I, but I've realized over the years, having a relationship with my kids, man, I, that's the priority. I gotta maintain this relationship with my kids. And if you're beating them over the head all the time and writing them about everything, that relationship, it won't be there. And a lot of times parents with kids, and sometimes it's all the kids' fault, but like parents with kids, parents with kids, like the reason the relationship severs is because parents don't know how to pick their battles and make the relationship more important than being right. You gotta prioritize that. I've, I have never cared about whether or not my kids are cold when we go outside. Do you know what I mean? Like, I have an obligation to tell my kids, like, hey, it's going to be 23, and we're going to be at a football game for three hours, so probably ought to wear a coat. And I'm like, I don't want to wear a coat. I'm like, I'm done. That's my job. I did it. It's over. <laughs> I won't think about it twice. We go to the football game, and they're like, <laughs> so cold. And I, I just, I don't even feel the need to be like, I told you so. I don't even, I'm just like, oh, I guess they won't do that mo no more, you know, and but my wife, on the other hand, will bring black blankets just in case and extra coats, and she'll stick them in the trunk and be like, just in case, you know. And so they always end up warm because she loves them and stuff. So <laughs> my, my point is, what is my point? My point is... <laughs> You gotta prioritize. You gotta prioritize like what matters. And if again, if you're right, the same thing is true with your relationship with everybody. If you're if you're beating people over the head with truth, by all means, please, we need to we need to put truth in people's lives. But if if you're beating them over the head with truth, if you're if you're prioritizing politics over faith, if you if you if you're not forming the relationship first, you'll lose the relationship. And it doesn't matter how much truth you have to offer you won't be able to share it with them because the relationship will be gone. Third, look for opportunity. I'm convinced you have opportunities all the time. Pray for opportunity. Pray for opportunity and you will find it. And when those opportunities arise, step into it. I don't care how tired you are. I don't care how busy you are. I don't care what ever, anything else that you got going on. Step into those opportunities. And finally, eventually an opportunity will arise. Say something. As simple as that. And I can just tell you from experience, I didn't say something when you know just the right thing to say. Don't worry about doing that. Because you will never have just the right things to say. But if you open your mouth in faith, if you lean into something, if, even if you feel like you're completely out of your depth, just say something and trust that God's going to use those words. There will be opportunities to be able to share your story, to be able to tell about your background, what your relationship with Christ means to you, how you got to the place, how, what a dirtbag you used to be and sometimes still are. Those are great opportunities to share your story. There's opportunities to, to have conversations about faith, and sometimes people will challenge your faith in that, and you'll, you'll be like, oh, I don't know what to do. This is your opportunity to grow and figure some stuff out, and I know, I know it's crazy, but like read a book. You know, figure some stuff out. I, the reason I say that is sometimes people go, well, I just don't know what to tell people. And I'm like, well, here's a book. And they're like, yeah, but what do I tell them? I'm like, read the book. <laughs> anyway, it's helpful. So anyway, you get these opportunities to say something. I believe that this is genuinely what it looks like to be on mission. And then on top of that, the church, what we do on the weekends, but not just the weekend, the whole community of the church the church is just a collective of people coming together to be on mission. And there is so much ministry. There's so many people that are connected with their relationship with God because of what they experience here. And so a vital part of joining the mission is, is to join the mission of the church. We want to invite you to join a team. We want to invite you to, to, to be a greeter, maybe as simple as that. We want to invite you to be a small group leader. We have, we have uh, about 50 leaders right now that are being trained in, in another room to be rooted leaders. We want to invite you to be a part of student ministry. We have such an opportunity in our kids' area, and there are so many spots available. We want to invite you to be a part of that, and, and that's how you grow and in your relationship with God. Now, you're... Your calling in life might be way bigger than just serving in a church, or maybe not. But don't ever stop doing this. 
Because we know, we know through the ministry of the church, this is how people are connected with their relationship with God, and it is vitally important what we do here. So if you don't serve in some capacities, we would love for you to do that. You can either go to the next step table after the service, or you can just text this number in right now. And then finally, I want to invite those of you who are kind of newer to the faith, or maybe you've just never done this, the, the first thing that you do, one of the first things you can do to be on mission is to get baptized. One of the first things you can do. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you get baptized. You get baptized because that's something Jesus called you to do. It's a step of faith. It's a step of obedience. It's vitally important for you to make that decision. But it is also something you do very outwardly that is a decision for the people around you. So what I would encourage you to do is to go after this service, if you've never made that decision to be baptized, I would encourage you to go out to uh, the ne Next Steps area where we have a baptism orientation class happening. And, and as you go through that orientation, you'll understand baptism, you'll understand the mechanics of how it works, and then what you do is you invite everybody you know. Because they'd kind of have to be a jerk to not come to your baptism, right? You and they may never come to church, but they're probably going to come to your baptism. You invite everybody you know, and you say, would you, would you come to my baptism? Would you be a part of that with me? And then they're going to ask you a question. They're going to be like, why are you doing that? Or why are you, there, There's probably going to be some questions in here, and you will have your first opportunity to share your story with them. So let's be on mission together as a church. And again, it doesn't matter if you just came to church for the very first time. What does it mean to take your next step of being on mission? Or maybe you've been in the church for a really long time and, and you've sort of gotten off mission. Come, come back to the thing that really matters. Let me ask you to stand up. Um, I'm going to close this in prayer and I'm going to pray that God's going to going to move uh, in this congregation. We have like 3,000 people that come to both our Windsor and our, and our uh, Loveland campuses. And Gosh, can you imagine if the 3,000 people that attend here each week, that they did this all the time, that they lived this out in their life? We would have so many opportunities to share our faith and to see God transform in people's lives. Let me, let me pray for that. Father God, I pray for, God, the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would move in every person's heart, people here, people in Loveland, those who are watching online. God, I pray that you would move in them. Show them the opportunities that are right in front of them. Give them, give them the opportunity to, to, be, to be a representation of who you are. God, I pray that you would, would call us and empower us and embolden us to be your ambassadors here on earth. I pray that when people look at our lives, they would see you. God, I pray that you would move in, in every person's heart and life, and God, that there would be fruit from them as they, as they simply take the step of faith to engage in that mission. And as we do, I pray that you would transform us to be like you. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen. Hey, thanks for coming today. Go sign up at the Next Steps, and uh, we'll see you next week.